Welcome everybody. How are we doing? All right. Great. I'm fantastic because I'm joined by um, just this wonderful collection of women who are um, playing at the Jazz Room this weekend. They, they had their first gig last night um, and we are just so excited to have them, to host them. Um, and honestly, welcome to those of you who are with us um, physically at the center and also those of you who are watching online um, welcome to all of you I'm really excited for this conversation um, so I want to start off by giving just just like the most painful briefest glimpse at sort of the wonderful things that these women are involved in and they are also going to continue to tell us about some of those things um, at, at, in our conversation and then I'm going to start us off with some questions and our conversation will unfold as we sort of learn about uh, the unique position of women in the current jazz scene, throughout jazz history, um, in education, just in so many areas of our, of our lives. So I want to first um, welcome Francesca Vignetti, who is a Boston-based musician, a polyphagic drummer, um, an improviser and composer from Bergamo, Italy. Um, she is known for her international collaborations in the avant-garde and free improv jazz scene, um, featuring such musicians as Steve Raymond, Joaquin Florent, Chris Davis, George Garzon, Nicole Glover, Val Janti, and many, many others. She has appearances at um, international jazz festivals, and her main project is Archipelagos, um, which she has performed in festivals and venues all across Europe and has won several competitions such as the Varga Jazz Contest 2021 um, and All You Have to Do is Play 2019. She is a Berkeley Global Jazz Institute alumna and also the founder of the independent record label Habitable Records. Um, so I want to say welcome to, uh, welcome to Francesca. Thank you. All right, and moving to the, to our next musician, Cheryl Cassidy is a saxophonist who's been hailed as a rising star alto saxophone in Downbeat Magazine. For the past 12 years, um, she's been listed on the San Francisco Jazz website in 2018, in a 2018 article as 10 rising women instrumentalists you should know. She's prominent on both New York and Chicago jazz scenes. Um, and has appeared on the Today Show, Good Morning America, The Colbert Show, um, and her most recent album, Altruism, was released in July 2021. She is also a proud mother of one, so welcome to Cheryl. Oh, and has played with Also, do not want to forget to mention she's played with Jennifer Hudson, Whitney Marcellus, and Roy Hargrove as well. Continue with your <laughs> And next, we have Ellen Rowe, the pianist and composer Ellen Rowe, who's world-renowned um, in both of those roles. Um, she released an album in 2019 entitled Momentum, Portraits of Women in Music. And this is original music rendered by eight amazing women jazz musicians and written for women specifically to honor those female trailblazers in various fields that have inspired her. So this ranges from jazz to politics to social justice, environmental advocacy, and sports. She's especially found 
um, a sort of home in improvisation with trail running and exercising. She's also been on faculty, a professor at the University of Michigan for 35 years. Uh, please welcome Ellen Merrill. And finally, um, we have Marion Hayden, who is a bassist. She is born in Detroit and as a member of the Detroit International Jazz Festival All-Star Ambassador Touring Ensemble continues to be crucial to that scene. She is one of the nation's finest proponents of the acoustic bass. She is a co-founder of the Touring Jazz Ensemble Straight Ahead, which was the first all-woman jazz ensemble signed to Atlantic Records. And her album uh, that came out in, in my correct 2009, please check it out, it's Visions. Um, it is a beautiful album. She is also a mother of two children in a long-term partnership. Please welcome Marion Hayden. All right, so something that I, I am um, really excited about with this group is that we are sort of spanning um, sort of generations and, and positions within the jazz world. And I'm wondering if start our conversation by speaking about sort of inspirations and mentors and, and mentorships that you have uh, experienced and that have been meaningful to you. I'll, I'll be glad that's, I'll kind of kick that off. Well, I have to say that coming up in Detroit, which has been one of the, uh, the great jazz cities of the world, it's been a place that has brought the world so many great musicians and this, uh, in this, uh, this style of music, um, I've had a chance to I had a chance to um, to work with some really wonderful people over the years. Um, some of them were not people that you would necessarily know, but they were people that were engaged uh, in a lifelong pursuit of playing jazz as their living. And so, um, um, some of them some of them you may know. Um, they you know some of them were actually males, not always women. Um, the great drummer Roy Brooks. Roy Brooks was someone who, who, uh, who worked for many years with Horace Silver. He toured with uh, Charles Mingus. Um, he worked with Thelonious Monk. Um, he was. He also toured for many years with Max Roach's Boom Boom, and uh, he was someone that I that I, that I spent a lot of time on the stand with. Um, also, one of our colleagues from the University of Michigan, Donald Walden, who's a fantastic tenor saxophonist. Um, there were just so many, and then. And generally, in terms of women, they were primarily vocal musicians. They're musicians in the vocal vocal category, and they were they were willing who were willing to have me on the stand, teach me how to how it was to actually be a musician, what one does, how you show how to show up at gig on time, reading uh, reading music, um, uh, their their vocal books, how to be supportive of the, of the vocal person. So, there were, uh, I had many opportunities to to really um, have a, get a deep dive, not only to, in, into a music with them, but also into their lives, which is something that's been very important to me. Uh, yeah, I grew up in southwestern Connecticut, and I did not have a whole lot of female mentors growing up. I had a junior high band director, a uh, jazz band director, who encouraged me. Um, but as I mentioned last night at the gig, our junior high jazz band was not exactly the Massachusetts uh, straight ahead jazz. I wanted to call it a poor jazz rock ensemble doing the Carpenters and things like that. Um, but I did have, as Mary has mentioned, I had uh, some male mentors, one especially in high school, uh, who pointed me in the direction of a great jazz piano teacher, John Mohegan. And uh, John was also a, a mentor in his own way. He was very gruff and um, could be pretty, I don't want to say nasty, wasn't, he was never nasty, but, but he expected a lot. And, did not suffer fools gladly. So I'm a little intimidated, but he introduced me to the music of Boris Silver and Buddy Powell and Bill Evans, so I'm forever grateful for that. Uh, and my mentors at, you know, when I went to college were really important to me at the Houston School of Music. Um, the first female uh, mentor that I really had in terms of taking an interest in my career and doing everything she, everything she could to help further along was uh, the great jazz pianist Marion McPartland. And Marion kind of took me under her wing. Uh, I got to Compose things for her, orchestrate some of her pieces uh, for when she would go out on the road. And she always encouraged me to stay in touch. Um, she, you know, would, would do whatever she could. She let me hear a piece of her apartment in New York City to practice in when I was in the city and she wasn't there. 
um, put in good words for me, had me transcribe a bunch of Priscilla Piano albums for print publication, which was a huge task and a great lesson in how to play some of the piano. Uh, so Mary is really, you know, was one of the first women that I encountered who was in a position to really be able to, to help out. Um, and as I, as was mentioned about this album, um, Momentum, uh, it took me, you know, I was on, on getting ready for sabbatical leave, um, for sabbatical leave a couple years ago from Michigan, and was wanting to do a, a record project, and was thinking, because, you know, we, we get asked this question very often, and it's an important question, who are our female role models? And I started to think about, women in my life who were not necessarily musicians, but had just really encouraged me to be myself or take chances or just were supportive in other things that I happened to be interested in, in addition to music. And some of the people who were so inspiring were, you know, I, I lived in Connecticut and I think it was the first female governor ever, Ella Grasso, when I was growing up. Um, I started thinking about my coaches in, in high school and people who encouraged me to play sports and playing sports and, and now running have been really important parts of my life, life because they've encouraged me to take part in something where I really feel good about myself and I don't have to go into this place of insecurity and imposter syndrome and all the things I think all of us can deal with um, as, as jazz musicians uh, and just really do something that's relatively simple to do, although it you know, takes a lot of <laughs> training and time, but um, just you know, put one foot in front of the other and go outside and enjoy nature. But all these sorts of things um, have helped help my confidence level. And so I thought, you know, I should really be writing, um, you know, some music for these, these women. And I also included, of course, um, people who were important to me a little bit later in life when I discovered Mary Lou Williams. I discovered Mary Lou through Jerry Allen, the incredible jazz pianist and composer um, and teacher, who I had the very good fortune, both Mary and I did, to teach with at the University of Michigan. And so there's a piece that honors Jerry and Mary Lou, and there's a piece that honors um, all the heroines of the civil, civil rights and social justice movement that I frankly did not know enough about and needed to do a deep dive and realize all these incredible accomplishments of, of these women. And uh, there's a piece for Michelle Obama, there's a piece for Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey, but all these women, I think, uh, have been inspiring to me. And so I just, I just thought, I've been thinking about that a lot recently in addition to the you know, great women who have also inspired me musically. So that. Um, I grew up in Oklahoma, and, uh, which is known historically as a central point for jazz. Uh, the big bands of Count Basie and the Blue Devils and, and people like Charlie Christian and Oscar Pettiford and Chet Baker are from Oklahoma. However, when I grew up, it was not a central jazz location, but my dad played jazz. And so every time I would visit my dad, we would spend time uh, playing jazz, also classical, classical piano, classical saxophone. Um, and it just so happened that my first classical saxophone teacher was a descendant of the great Eugene Rousseau who helped uh, develop classical saxophone. Um, and so, you know, coming out of that lineage and then playing jazz and learning about Charlie Parker and Cannonball Adderley and John Coltrane, and, you know, all this music from my dad, um, it, it developed the deep seed in me to want to play. Uh, but however, when I wanted to switch over to classical, my dad even mentioned jazz is no place for a woman. We don't want you to do this. I did not have um, family support except for my mom. So my mom was um, a huge inspiration when I wanted to start playing jazz. She, she said, go for it. In fact, she said, you do it or you're not coming home. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I have my early classical teachers and I did have a jazz teacher, Brian Goral, who's the head of jazz at University of Central Oklahoma. He was my first jazz teacher. Um, but, you know, I moved to New York not long after that, and uh, honestly, I struggled to find mentors. I practiced, and I played, and you know, kept repeating, practice, play, practice, play, and I saw a lot of my male counterpoints getting mentors. Um, it took me some time, and it wasn't until um, Ingrid Jensen put me on the bandstand, and then shortly after, Sherry Miracle hired me in her band as lead alto, um, that I actually got to work and tour and see the world. And shortly after that, uh, the director of the Dizzy Gillespie All-Stars, John Lee, heard me. Um, and in that band, I met my, my mentors, uh, like Jimmy Heath and James Moody, who Jimmy Heath uh, mentored me for many, many years before he passed. And uh, I still work with John very closely. And you know, I was mentored by Roy Hargrove through that band. Uh, great players like Cyrus Chestnut and 
Louis Nash, and, and I could go on, but they were all somewhat mentors for me because I was the youngest in the band at the time. Um, so it took some time, it took some work, um, but I, that was kind of my guiding light. All of those people on, on the way over my, my life. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm coming from a super small, super tiny village in the Alps in Italy. So, um, yeah, hearing out I do HBC, as you said, I also think that you have like a lot of, you know, mentors in general, like female, female mentors especially. So I had to come to the States actually to get my, you know, my, my first female mentors. And um, yeah, I mean, I grew up playing drums, like I come, I come from a music family, so classical music was something like super, you know, big in my family because everybody, everybody played. And um, so yeah, like as, you know, as I also mentioned yesterday, I, um, like in order to find my own, you know, way through music, I, I felt like I had to, you know, take a little bit of distance from the, you know, strictness of the classical music environment. Um, so yeah, I started off with some, you know, rock progressive bands um, as, a, as a teenager and, and eventually approached jazz um, when I was about 15, 16 years old. Um, I had this great drums teacher, his name is Stefano Bertoli, who um, pointed me at some other, you know, drummers uh, who, who taught in conservatories in, in Italy, such as uh, Stefano Bagnoli, who's uh, um, you know, who's touring, who's been touring for many years with Nicolava, Paolo Fresu, uh, and all these like more famous, uh, you know, Italian jazz players. Um, yeah, but I felt like, you know, I wasn't really welcomed, uh, you know, in the jazz institutions, uh, also like in the, you know, in the, in the educational institutions uh, in Italy, because I was, all, like, I was always the only female drummer, you know. So um, I decided to go abroad. I went first to uh, to the Netherlands. I lived uh, uh, close to Amsterdam for 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 a couple of years, and then moved to uh, to Brussels, where I ended up finding my first uh, male mentor. Uh, his name is Stefan Galon. Uh, he's a, a Belgian drummer, and I studied Indian music with him. Um, he has like this great band called uh, Akamun, and I uh, you know um, I, I mean I fell in love with the you know Indian music, like rhythms, and you know. Kind of like the, the more contemporary uh, and improvised uh, jazz scene, um, and that brought me to uh, a residency in, in Canada, actually. Um, in the band, which is called the Banff Jazz Residency, which is run by uh, drummer Tishan Sori and uh, pianist Vijay Yair, uh, which are you know, you know, like two great, great mentors for me. Um, and during that residency, I had the opportunity to study with that. Uh, with female musicians like uh, like Linda Linda Ho, um, and Tana Roberts, um, uh, Igor Jensen, yeah, and uh, yeah, and that was like such you know mind blowing for me because you know where where I, where I came where I come from like we don't have any of that you know so yeah and, and, and you know and after that like I you know I find the courage to um, to apply for for Berkeley and uh, I did my masters at Berkeley. And got the you know my first um, female mentors uh, like um, Terry and Carrington uh, drummer uh, Linda Ho and, and Chris Davis and I had the chance like you know to you know to perform with them so um, yeah and just like you know feel honored to you know to be here today with these great players and uh, yeah I feel you know I'm a, you know very um, lucky mentee at, at this moment yeah. <laughs> that I think something that stands out to me in each of your comments is um, uh, to take a phrase from Ellen in particular but that all of you are kind of mentioning is um, this being in a position to help out that that there needed to be folks who were in that position to be mentors um, and then kind of later on to what it means to be in the position of being a mentor and, and what like what it takes to get folks in those roles, um, whether those roles are jazz specific or sort of expanding outward to sort of um, other types of support. And so I'm wondering, in terms of, of institutions and thinking about, you were, you were talking about there is sort of not an institutional place for you, um, why, why we need to sort of talk about and focus on hiring and supporting female musicians in particular in this conversation. I'll, I'll start with this just um, 
a weird and I had a Christian about the same amount of time. Um, but uh, I think there's, there's so many issues, and I'll try to not you know, go on for hours here. But um, I just contributed a chapter to a book on jazz and gender that's coming out throughout Wiki Press, and so I've had a lot of chance to try to get my thoughts uh, clarified or codified. I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. Um, but the, the important thing is that young women need to be seeing themselves in the people they, they look at on a regular basis, whether it's on stage, in the classroom, directing a jazz band, uh, sitting on a panel like this, um, and it, the list goes on and on. I mean, <laughs> the women, uh, Anika Wine and Davis is in the world, who are presenting women artists, who are out there as incredibly successful women artists, who are just about to pick up a leadership role in the biggest jazz education organization we have, which is the best news I've heard in decades. Um, but these young women are dropping out of their junior high jazz bands or college their high school jazz bands because they don't see themselves. They don't, their band directors aren't playing pieces by women composers. Um, and I'm not working really hard right now to try to change that up. I've been writing for younger bands and we have a composition contest uh, coming up now for people specifically, women composers to write for um, younger groups, and there's a nice prize with it, and so forth and so on. Um, but I think the fact that all of us persevered through what we did, um, you know, speaks to the fact that we loved the music so much that we were kind of, you know, part of my friend, she just screwed, screwed us, you know, we, we want to do this, and we are going to do this, and we were very fortunate, you know, we did have, you know, the male and female mentors that we did, most, mostly male. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I don't think every young woman should have to struggle like that. And there's all kinds of societal reasons why young women may be afraid to stand up and take a solo, uh, to put themselves out there in the spotlight. There's tons of research on, you know, young men are always more willing to raise their hand in class, blah, blah, blah. Um, so I think it's critically important that all of us are being activists in getting more young women playing, encouraging them to play in college. Our program, and you know, just break for two seconds here, this Marion's been a big part of this too. Um, I've really been active trying to get more young women in Michigan in the jazz program, and we have maybe an undergraduate population of 60, we have 13 young women, and none of them are singers because we don't have, well, maybe one of them is, we don't really have a jazz vocal program, so that means they're all instrumentalists, um, and nothing against singers, we just haven't, that's not a part of our program we've developed. And they have this incredible sense of community, we go out once a semester, it's girls night out, they see Marion, they see myself, they saw Jerry when she was there, and Martha Travers is another member of our faculty, so it's, you know, like I said, I, I could talk for hours, but I, I won't. I'll turn it over to someone else. Um, yeah. Yeah. I second that. Um, I think that, that we have a, a great opportunity now to say that probably um, uh, possibly different from my, from my other uh, dear friends and colleagues on the panel, I actually did not learn jazz in school. I actually learned it in the community context. Um, and that was uh, that was really probably the way it was uh, it was uh, learned for many years until maybe the early seventies or so. I'm thinking about Texas State and a couple others were maybe the first ones to actually come on with a, an official jazz program. So I actually learned from uh, in the, uh, from what I like to call the community scholars. And these are people that are really very and these are primarily uh, black folks in, in, in the community. Detroit is a city that is about eighty five percent black. And so um, we have, so I had people that I worked with that were just fabulous arrangers, you know, so many people that arranged for uh, all the Motown acts were actually primarily jazz musicians. And they were, you know, some of them, some of them had learned some arranging skills in school, but primarily their uh, improvisational skills and skills as jazz musicians, people that really play, play in the idiom, uh, they learned those on their, on their own and, and through working with other people. So I feel that in a lot of ways, um, women have, uh, you know, we have actually benefited a lot by having the music come, um, become uh, uh, part of the academy. Because now there's kind of a, a way that you can, there's kind of a little bit more of a, um, a regular uh, a set way that you can learn, that you can actually take classes. Whereas I had to be kind of a bold young woman and uh, get in there and uh, I had to get in, uh, uh, and just and learn and learn in a different kinds of way. My mentors were not always sitting there saying, "This is how you write something out." Sometimes they were doing that. Sometimes they would, I would just be there, be present when they were doing it. So I think that we have a really great opportunity to build on something in terms of getting young women in uh, 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 to be a part of jazz because of the academy. 
Of course, there are other things that we have really lost with this, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Part of the things that we've lost is that is being able to have a real inter intergenerational perspective. And I find that a lot of times in the academy, you have a certain age, and especially at these days, you have a certain age, and people that have a certain, a certain a level of um, opportunity to actually be a part of the academy because it is expensive. And so there, there are certain folks that are kind of locked out of this process. And that, that part is, I think, is not, is not helpful. It's not been something that's, we've missed an opportunity to really enrich, enrich the field in a certain other kinds of ways. But I do think that we, we you know, that we're on, we're on a step to get more women, uh, to get more women uh, infused in all the different ways. And so we do, uh, as Ellis said, we need to be there not only uh, in, the, in the schools of students, we need to be, we need to teach, which being a student is the next step to that, but we also really have to have them as um, record producers, as, you know, as people that are, that are promoters. We really need them horribly badly in the media, really, really badly. We really need more women to, to be out there writing about women. Um, and those are the things I think that are really going to kind of put us on a, a much faster track to what we're trying to see, which is a normalization of the Sorry, long no, answer. No. I think I'm I'm like sitting here like taking notes. I hope they want to like pass this on to my students. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I'm 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 loving it. Um, so it sounds like you and Ellen um, at the University of Michigan, you are able to um, to sort of work within the structure of, of a big institutional setting to have places where you can you can support women, um, your the women students who are who are coming in, um, and grow that program. I mean that that's a that's a I mean numbers wise that's a huge number um, for for a jazz program to have, um, and so I think and I think that the the sort of down the kind of pitfalls the the things that we can fall into in, in the academy um, that you're mentioning also yes. Um, yeah, there's a sort of give and take, and, and how can we sort of address both um, both of these issues so that we can keep it keep the gatekeeping away a bit. There's a fair amount of gatekeeping that goes on, and it's it's been, it's, it's been a, something that's been an issue with me for a number of years. Um, I just feel like I know certain the, the people that mentor me were not normally invited into the academic the, ac the academic sphere. Um, our school, our university mm -hmm. schools, very much. Mm -hmm. They may get a little better now, but I just think that we're really missing that opportunity to really get insight. And then we then we study them in a jazz history book, and when in fact they were actually walked amongst us, and we never took it, took uh, took, uh, took the time to bring to bring them in, right? So why why just study them in a history book when they can be in front of you and you can say, oh, here's a nine year old so and so. They uh, they toured with the uh, they toured with Miles Mabley, you know. Maybe that might be a, something to you know to have reflect on personally, you know, personally, and maybe the students will really get something from that. You know, just chime in. I I could not agree more with what Miriam's saying, and uh, I, I always tell my students in my classes that I think jazz education is a double-edged sword. I mean, there are all these how-to books, and you know, all these things just you know Google, Wikipedia, whatever, where you get instant answers. When in reality, thinking about how Miriam learned music, it took time. Effort, interaction, personal communication, and all this gets, and not all, <laughs> some of it get, gets lost when you sit there and go, yeah, you use a scale of this chord instead of saying, hey, uh, transcribe the vinyl solo in this tune. You don't have to write it down, just learn it, play it, you know, understand how, what, what he was doing, or, or, you know, not just Miles, but anybody. And it's just, I, I'm constantly struggling with this, this issue. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just glad you brought it up. I, I spent four years in New York without being in school and only being on the scene and doing what Mary was talking about, being a part of the community, learning from the elders, that kind of thing. So when I went to school, I went to the new school, and it was a good school, but it was mainly a vehicle for me to meet people of my age and to play with people of my age. Um, because we don't have a 52nd Street anymore. Nice. <laughs> so, right. um, and then when I went to Juilliard, um, that was kind of continued, and I did learn a lot of things at Juilliard, particularly to dig deeper into the history of the music, go back to Louis Armstrong, uh, Buddy Bolden, Louis Armstrong, City of the Shade, and really dig to the bottom um, of the history. 
and, and that was very valuable, but yeah, you, you can't learn jazz in a vacuum. And it's important to see the, the community that's, that's still available in the music. And whether that means going out and finding them or bringing them to universities is important. I've been teaching in the university system for the last five years. Uh, and from what I've seen, um, we're making a lot of progress, but there's still uh, a vast discrepancy for gender. And there's so many great female artists out there now. I'm not sure why there's not one art, female artist at, at all the major institutions full time. I just, I don't understand um, why that's not happening still. Um, so, and, and there's so many qualified, you know, I have my master's, a lot of people have uh, master's and doctorate degrees, and uh, it's, there's still a lot of uh, red tape to get through. So we're working on that. Yeah. And I feel for, like, you know, like a woman um, coming up uh, through the, in, in the yes environment, like, it's, it's really important, like, to have both, like, you know, the educational aspect, like, in the, the academic, you know, aspect of it, but also, like, I've been, like, lately I've been joining this, uh, this cohort, it's called um, uh, Mutual Mentorship for Musicians, for Musicians, uh, it's run by uh, singers, um, Sam Serpa and Ming Shu, and they just organized this uh, mentorship program for, for women, like, outside from, of the academic context, you know. And uh, it's intergenerational. Like, yeah, I think it's really super cool because it really empower, empowers you. Like, like, yeah, like you get to, you know, to know the, you know, the, the personal stories and then to share. Like, yeah, what what we've been doing, like, <laughs> right here, right now, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I guess like that's a, that's a fundamental part of it. Yeah. One thing special is why is here, but we should mention it anyway. Um, there's an incredibly, I think, uh, wonderful initiative uh, run by the Jazz Education Network. And prior to that, the International Association of Jazz Education for Jazz Education, I'm going to get my acronyms right, um, called Sisters in Jazz. And Mary was one of the very founders of this, of this program. She had another friend of ours, and she did Sunny Wilkinson. And, and IAJE you know, got the ball rolling, providing you know, support for this to happen. But it's exactly what Francesca's talking about it's a mentorship program. And Women in Jazz Organization in New York City also has a really great mentorship program. But the Sisters in Jazz Collegiate Combo Competition, um, you know, we take applicants from uh, all over and have them you know, put in audition tapes, and it's for collegiate level primarily. And uh, we form a combo of all young women, and uh, they get to play, they get to rehearse together with an incredible artist, um, you know, Ingrid Jensen, Tia Fuller, um, you know, I'm hoping Miriam will be one of the next. And then they rehearse for a couple of days, and then they give a concert at the Gen Conference, and it's a big deal. Many of them have never been in a group with all women before, and it's incredibly empowering. And all the young women over the years, and we've been involved in this for many years, uh, speak to what a difference it is for them to be in that environment. And you know, and no offense to our lovely male colleagues and friends and artists, but the young women, I think, do not have to deal with the you know potential for vibing or you know, just just kinds of things that, that tend to happen a little bit more with the young women. That we know it's it's incredibly empowering. So I just wanted to put that point in there. I'm a sister alum. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember who your faculty member was? Ingrid. And that's how I started with Jensen. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, yeah, I was going to say you're, you're an alum. My um, jazz piano teacher was an alum, um, Karen Lotus Merman, and she met Nicole Yamegan. Um, who, who then I was able to meet through her and is just a lovely person and these networks just sort of keep, yeah, they just keep spreading, spreading downward. We were just reflecting on a, with a, one of the other co-founders of Sunny Wilkinson the other day about when it first started and um, which um, I recall was pregnant with my second child at the time and uh, we would, I mean, we basically started this with no money. It was just, just a, Super, you know, kind of kitchen table grassroots. Pool. We had to get some. Yeah, we were meeting at a, at a big boy restaurant. I, I could hardly fit myself into a booth at the time, and that was about 1996. So that's been a goodly, goodly moment. Wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you for for that work, because that is work to come up with these ideas and to, and then also to come up with such successful ideas that, that then sort of continue to spin around. Um, I want to, sorry, 
piggyback off of something that you, you brought up, which was collaborating. And I, I've been on a couple of these panels before, and I've seen enough of these panels. There's always a little bit of anxiety when we talk about collaborations and all-female groups, and we always want to um, be very welcoming and open to our male colleagues, of course, because many of us have had wonderful male colleagues. But I wondered if um, you might speak a little bit more. Um, you were kind of headed in that direction, Alan. But um, if any of you might speak a little bit more um, to those all-female collaborations and, and sort of what what you have gotten from them, what you have felt in them, um, that's just a little bit different. Well, I, I, I definitely, I mean, we all have a lot to say about this. I'm not sure. Do you want to talk about Diva for a minute? Just before I launch into momentum, or <laughs> Diva was the first time. That I well, other than Sisters and Jazz, I guess Sisters and Jazz was the first time. That, I, that was a small group though. That was five, I believe, five of us. But Diva was the first time I played with an all-female big band, and to feel that kind of kinship with um, the fellow women in the band was really something special. It was it was different. A lot of the pressures that I felt um, in bands before then were not there, but then there were new pressures. It was just it was different. Um, but, you know, I enjoyed my time with the band. And, you know, I think we were all trying to get to a certain place musically with the advice. Yeah, I, I got to, to occasionally tour with Eva and write, you know, Sherry asked me to write you know, music, so I had some charts in their, in their book. And the times I went out with them, it was uh, very different <laughs> from uh, being in some of the all male big bands I've been in. Um, I love to see it at that. But it was, it, was, it was great and fun and, and liberating in, in many ways. But um, I'll just speak for a second about the Momentum Project because what was really wonderful about that was the fact that I did kind of get to pick um, all women for the project to be in the band. But written, I picked you know, people I'd known for a long time, um, people you know, both that I was friendly with and that I you know, of course respected their musicianship in a deep way and that I knew would just be all in you know, in the project. And uh, it has really been rewarding. The, I think audiences seem to feel the, the, the love on the stage and uh, the, the sense of commitment that everybody has to the music. And I just feel like for myself, it's the project that's given me the most joy, both to have a chance to write, I love writing for Octet, Five Horns, it's just you know, it's such a beautiful blend of instruments. Each woman has a very unique, personal, powerful voice, and it's been so cool to get to showcase them. Cheryl has played with us, and it's just great to have have her involved, and Marion, of course, is the, the basis of the band. Um, Alison Miller, uh, it's Ingrid Jensen, uh, Tia Fuller, who has played. Regina Carter, who was on tour for one or two of our gigs. Uh, Regina Mayhew, Lisa Perrot, who is an extraordinary uh, saxophonist, baritone, and, and altos, play, played with us. Um, Melissa Gardner, uh, and here's where the mentorship come, comes in a little bit. Melissa's a graduate, fabulous trumpetist, you may not have heard of, but you need to check her out. Moves in Syracuse, has two children, just had a baby girl. We should throw out with her to the Jet Conference, and she had brought her one on along. And, uh, but she, she didn't let us the, the gig, and so we all got to meet her newborn, which was pretty darn cool. Um, but being a former student, it felt so good to be able to hire her and see her just, you know, what she's accomplished in the last 10, 15 years. And we've had uh, Meg Brennan, who's been on board with them, but Barry Blair on one of our last couple of gigs, and then Kaylee Wilder, who just finished her master's. She's Detroit based now, amazing composer, improviser. Um, so that's been, been really cool, the, the chance to sort of pass, pass things on. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit on, um, I co-founded a band called Straight Ahead. Uh, this band started in, oh, approximately like 1987. It's been around for quite a while. Uh, we were able, uh, all of us were from Detroit, from my hometown, uh, including one of the, the, the uh, co-founding members is Regina Carter, who was uh, just sublime. Uh, violinist, um, and the other members were Galen McKinney on drums, um, Alina Moore on pianist, and then we started with a really great vocalist by the name of uh, Mickey Graydon. Mickey's in New York now, but she wasn't, so she and actually ended up doing our recordings with us. But um, that was, that, that band has been really instrumental in terms of my personal growth. As a musician, we were very open to each other's uh, compositions. Um, we did a lot of um, Cooperative um, arranging, right? So a lot, of, a lot of the a lot of the pieces that we did had, you know, had a lot of input from everyone in the band. Um, I definitely learned a lot of business skills in that band. I knew how, I learned how to book a tour, air airline, hotels, 
um, how to negotiate contracts. Uh, that was it was extremely empowering to be involved with that. Um, we actually did three records for Atlantic Records, so we had a major record deal, which was which was also, and that was during the time when record companies probably may have done a little bit more from you than what I understand they do these days. It's a little little little, little bit of a different experience, and um, it was just um, it was just really really a great thing. Luckily, the band still does does uh, perform together and tour, uh, as a matter of fact. But that um, being in that milieu was um, was something that uh, that for sure made me feel like there's just really no good reason for women not to be out out there um, more, except for the fact that that you know someone needs to make a phone call. Um, you know, a lot of times I found that one of the impedances for touring with guys were things like they didn't want to get an extra hotel room. And uh, which was really a pretty lame reason not to have a musician on the stand with you. Um, and these days, everybody gets separate hotel rooms anyway. So you know, there's just you know, there's just so many, so many little odd things that would get, that I found would get in the way of being able to to do tours with with guys. Whereas we, when I work with that band, we just we just get out there and make it happen. Um, there's a certain cooperative spirit that I will say I have found lacking in some of my some of the bands with my brothers. They've been, they've been good, but the cooperative spirit that I found in, in that band, Straight Ahead, has, has really been a uh, second to none. Everybody has just been in to make it happen, to make it work. You know. Can I piggyback off that? Yes. That's, that's excellent. And, you know, it's one thing to talk about collaboration, which is great, but what I'm really interested in is integration. Um, I've felt coming up being the only woman in many, many groups that there's always been a kind of an unspoken rule of one. Um, you know, wherever you go, there's a, there's a band that maybe has one female in it, maybe not. Um, and I want to get past that because there's so many women, like Marion was saying, now everyone gets their own hotel room. That's not an excuse. Um, and, and what I find is that people tend to stick to what they're most comfortable with. And I think it's time for us to be a little bit uncomfortable. You know, it's time for us to really start thinking. If you see a band that's all one type of person, to be like, hmm, did they really think about it? Do they know anybody else? Do they try? You know, uh, the great bassist Reggie Workman uh, brought that to my attention when I was very young. Um, he was Coltrane's, John Coltrane's bassist. If you don't know Reggie Workman, um, you should. Yeah, you should. Sure. <laughs> and um, and since then, I've been an advocate. And many people, both male and female, that are my contemporaries, have been very uh, adamant about advocating for: Do you have a woman in your band? Is your band racially mixed like you know how you know how much are you really thinking about diversity in in the bandstand and trying to create that I'm gonna go one more on you Sherelle for that because I think that's really important and here's here's my next my, my next level up on that is what I noticed when festivals book a lot of times what you'll see is you'll see women as leaders but you don't see them as side men and to be honest, excuse me, better pilots, side persons. Um, then, frankly, there's a better earning to be lived to be made as a side person. Um, but you know, but if you can't get side person work, then you end up being a leader. And so, I think a lot of us end up having to, you know, recreate the, reinvent the wheel, and always having to be the leader. When in fact, there's way more, there's way more opportunities out there to tour if you're a side person. But somebody's got to call you for a side person job. And here too, and, and one of the things I've noticed, and I've heard people say this, and sometimes I just figure it out for myself, <coughs> but there might be a festival opportunity or a conference opportunity uh, for, let's say, you know, our, our prospective all-female bands, and you look at yours and say, oh, well, you've got Artemis, or you've got, you know, Shannon Uncle True, or whatever, we've already got one. We've got one. one. <laughs> we got one. We don't need to buy the book probably to book another. And my response is, there, and no offense here, there have been nothing but all male bands for the last, you know, 75 years, right? And then we're just starting to get some, why not have an entire conference of all women, if, if, you know, if they're high quality. I'm not trying to say we want feminism or we want to be out there, you know, it's not strong. But that just, that just blows my mind when I, when I think about that, you know? It's just, and, and, and Mary and Trey, I mean, we, we, we both know a festival where, you know, there may be a few more female vocalist leaders and maybe an instrument leader, but then after that, there's, there should be no women. <laughs> that's, that's, that's okay. 
that's okay. We can we can we can use that. Um, uh, I think Cheryl, what you were saying about um, that people do sort of what they're they're comfortable with, um, and I'm wondering if the the conversation can sort of if we can change what we're comfortable with or what looks uncomfortable. Maybe what's uncomfortable is when you have that band that is sort of looking a little bit the same. When you have that band with the one with the one woman, when you have that band that is not racially integrated, that why can't why is that not the uncomfortable sort of thing that we can we can deal with? So I appreciate sort of your your bringing that up. Um, I'm wondering if um, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but but something that my students ask me a lot, and they're asking me because I'm a jazz historian, so you know part of the part of the job, but. What they're asking me is how the past is informing the present, how sort of past experiences of women in jazz still inform or inform differently sort of present day experiences. And I wondered if there were any of you who, who have felt either kinship with things in the past that have happened that you've, you've kind of learned about, or if there are um, kind of moments where you're like, oh man, that's just, it's so, I'm so glad I didn't have to deal with that sort of on either end of, of that spectrum. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit, I mean, again, it's a big one because, yeah, it's, again, I, it's a selfish. My students ask me this all the time, and I'm, yeah, I'm just yeah. sort of curious yeah. what you would yeah. say. Um, you know, I, I really came came about in the 2000s. I lived in New York in 2000. And I look at my predecessors like Virginia Mayhew. Um, you know, in the 80s and the 90s, there were so few female musicians or saxophone players that there really was just one. Um, when I came to New York, there was two. There was me and Tia Fuller on the scene. And oh, and Erica Von Kleist. I guess there was three. She was at Lincoln Center. So there was, there was three when I came on the scene. Um, and then actually, I think me and well, we were all there about the same time in 2000. We all got there. And then shortly after that, two or three years later, three more showed up. So there's power in numbers. And in my generation, I wasn't the only one. Um, so I look at Virginia and I say, well, she was really strong. Or even by Red. By Red, um, but, you know, she had a big band in the, what was the 40s? In the, in the 40s, you know, it was just her, really. You know, and maybe some of the players in the Sweet Hearts and Rhythm Brothers. You know, they were they were really uh, solo ships. You know, whereas I came up at a time where you know I didn't necessarily deal with that. But that's a great point. And when I did, was doing some research for the, um, I just wrote a new piece for Momentum called the Girls in the Band, and it's celebrating all these women that we're, we're talking about right now, the Byrds and Gilda Smith and uh, uh, the International Sweet Hearts Rhythm and Tyler and Claire Bryant. Uh, this, this goes on. But yeah, in re researching them, what they had to deal with, um, as opposed to, you know, we still have to struggle, but it's nothing compared to what, what they had to go through. And uh, a lot of them, you know, were forming bands and were asked to be part of bands because the men had gone off to fight in World War II. When the men came back, they were basically out of work again. And so it was great that they had a, a moment in the sun and could be heard and have been documented. You can hear them in the recordings. Um, but those women were so courageous and, and you know, just, my mind, uh, think about it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I ditto. Um, I, um, I took, a, I remember when Straight Ahead first started, one of the comments we used, to, we used to get from people was, they asked us if we'd ever heard of the International Sweethearts of Rhythm because they would tour to Detroit on a regular basis. And um, that, that was something that was very inspiring. And um, the, I had also people came and asked me about Melba Liston. And it just so happened that there's a there's a really a really fabulous uh, alto saxophone player in my uh, in my town, um, uh, Larry Smith. I think Larry's originally from Pittsburgh, but Larry used to tour with Melba, so he would tell me a lot about Melba. And then I was actually on a panel at the um, Kennedy Center when um, uh, back in uh, I think they would have a women in jazz uh, better women in jazz uh, festival. And they had Melba as a um, Melba as a guest, and at that point she she had, was having some health challenges. She was in a wheelchair, but I did have a chance to uh, 
speak with her on the panel. Billy Taylor was the moderator. And um, I just got, was so inspired by her. Um, and I recall very vividly uh, reading uh, her recollections of when she first started working with the Dizzy Gillespie band and that some of the cats made a couple of really nasty remarks, um, you know, within earshot of her. And that was the kind of thing that was allowed to go on at that time. So I think that things have gotten better, but I do think that it still takes a lot of perseverance. And um, those women, those women are actually very uh, inspiring to me in terms of the level of perseverance they had to, they had to have to be able to continue to do what they did at, at you know such a high level of mastery, of, you know, of arranging and just the overall musicality. Yeah. Um, how do you? Deal with the challenges that you that you face in your role and, and kind of that stress and still kind of manage to just sort of keep playing and keep doing it and like just you you mentioned like just you kind of just stuck it out like and, and just did that and I know Francesca you um, talked a lot about your experiences in Italy and, and sort of not having any female membership until coming um, to North America and. Uh, but you stuck it out and you, you kept, you were able to sort of keep going. And so I'm wondering if you all could kind of talk about, like, how did you deal with some of those challenges and, and um, what would you say to a young musician who's sort of facing these and, and trying to make that decision? Do I stay in the band or do I, do I not? Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, it was just, uh, I don't know, I like playing the drum so much that, uh, you know, that nobody, you know, could stop me. And uh, and I think it was also kind of uh, you know interesting for me to you know see the reactions like you know from people I see you know like a, a female drummer or, or whatever and then like you know later on, later on like like first it was like you know just like yeah you know, it's so sort of surprising how, how people react to that um, you know later on it became like kind of annoying you know because like you keep on having those comments like uh, oh yeah you play good you say for me. And, uh, and I also like, you know, I also really dislike, you know, the, you know, the marketing aspect of it, you know, because like sometimes, the, you know, there are not so many female drummers out there, you know, I get like calls to play in, the, you know, like uh, festivals or those kind of stuff that are, you know, made, made to, you know, you know, just to market the, the gig and sell it better or something. And it's uh, once they ask me to play in high heels or something. Mm -hmm. You don't like I don't do maybe other people do that, but it's a uh, but you you know so sort of like yeah it's a uh, you know it's it's been a hard ride for sure, <laughs> but uh, and I think that's why it's it's so important that, that you know that we do this like what we're doing right now is to you know um, you know to give an example to to the future generations that you know that is actually possible that this should be not normal. You know? And uh, yeah, so. thank you. Thank you for sharing that. The high heels, ooh, okay. <laughs> um, it's, yeah. it's, it's very foolish than that. Yeah. yeah. I'm curious yeah. bands that someone's never heard about and maybe perhaps played in um, where there's actual requirements for makeup and a certain type of dress that you're supposed to wear. Really cool. I think those days are coming to an end, or I would like to think have come to an end. Well, you were asking what kept us going. Yeah, yeah. Um, one thing for me, uh, when I moved to New York, I didn't have family support, um, and I didn't have scene support either for a long time. So what kept me going was my faith, uh, faith in God, and, and uh, just really having faith in myself. You know, my mom really helped build a confidence within myself before I left, um, and and I had a lot of a lot of I guess just belief that I was. I was there to play. And when I showed up to play at the sessions, I didn't show up as a female to play jazz. I showed up as a musician. And to me, we were all the same. As we were all there as musicians. There was no difference. And um, later, I started running into women who would say, oh, you go to sessions? Well, it's, it's kind of vibey. I don't like to go because it's, it's vibey. And it's only vibey if, if you know someone's really not playing at the level, or, or maybe because you're a woman, they're going to vibe you. But, um, and that's happened. I've had men just step right in front of me and start playing before. But then 
I step up after them and, and I cut them. So, <laughs> and then they look at me and say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm so, I, I didn't know you could play like that. Oh, okay. Um, you know, so it can be fun too if you could turn it around. Um, but I think it, it takes a lot of courage. And I'm still going to tell any woman that it still takes a lot of courage. And you have to know that you're made to do this. That, that this is what you're supposed to do. Yeah, but also the fact that, like, that you, you know, when you go to sessions or something, like, you have to prove yourself. Because if you're not good, good enough, they're going to bite you. Because you don't play with any other woman, you know. So there's this like double uh, condition, you know, that it's not, you know, it's, it's just a man. And, you know, he doesn't play that well, you know. Yeah, you didn't play the well when you have your friends. But like if you're a woman, like the, the spotlight is all on you, you know? It's and they're waiting for you to, you know, to make a mistake or something just to say, ah, okay, you know? That's true. But you have to be willing to get dirty. Like, my first couple years, I didn't know enough tunes at all. So what I would do is I would play something I didn't know, and I would fall on my face, and I would make myself leave and learn a tune. And the next night, I would show up. And the minute I didn't know a song, I would go home, practice it, come back and play it again. Um, and yeah, you're exactly right. There's a double-edged sword because I was a woman. People were waiting for me to fail. People, um, you know, I, I did feel that more eyes maybe were on me. But at the same time, when I started getting better, I got the extra support too. Um, and and um, I think it's something that you can turn around, but you just have to be willing to do it. I'll jump in for a quick second here too. I, I um, started teaching, I guess, when I was like 24. I was very lucky to get this part-time job teaching at the University of Connecticut, which is where I grew up in. Um, so I fully invested myself in the teaching. I didn't play as much as I probably would have liked. Uh, I played a little bit here and there. Um, and it wasn't until I moved to Michigan and had a student who uh, was a very good business person and entrepreneur, and uh, who I guess, you know, I don't know, like my playing, he's my private student. And he was like, what do you, what do you mean you don't have an album out? I never really thought I was something I should do. And this young man just like was all over me. He actually helped me find the graphic designer, helped me get the uh, you know the, the studio book and the whole thing. And so you know I got I got that record out and I was like, you know, I really love to do this. I don't know why I haven't been, been doing this. And I, I just find that kind of ironic that it took one of my students to kick me in the pants. But you know, I, I did felt a lot of insecurity that went my play for all the reasons we've kind of been getting at with regards to a lot of male colleagues and a lot of females with players, especially in Connecticut. Um, but once I had that taste of, oh, wow, this feels really, really good, and then I just started to, you know, have a little more belief in myself and just, and just uh, kept, kept on going. But I will say that, and I'm sure Mary and you know, maybe all of us have had these experiences, there's certainly been cases of not getting paid the same, certainly not getting the same initial level of respect, having to prove yourself, and to be honest, unwanted advances. Uh, and my young, my female students, our female students, when we have these get-togethers, we talk, we have to really talk about how to handle yourself in those situations. And what I've been counseling is, is to have a game plan. Don't, you know, when you're caught, and psychologists talk about this as being a, a hot or a cold state, state of, uh, I'm sure they say state of mind, but the, the cold is when you're taken by surprise in a situation, you haven't thought through what to do, and you're just, you know, frozen, and, and you may not come up with the best response to deal with the situation, but if you think through ahead of time, like, Okay, if I get you know proposition, or if I get you know hit on, or whatever it happens to be, this is the language I'm going to use. Or uh, if my pay is because of this, and this is what I'm going to do. Um, these are the circumstances under which I will not work with this person again. They all they just talk about all those things. Nobody talked about that stuff with us, and I just feel like they have to have a, a game plan. And it's so, and I'm sorry that it still is necessary, and hopefully eventually it won't be. But it's some of our strategies. Um, and I, I think that there are, I think that some, there is um, some more transparency about and, and kind of acknowledgement that those kinds of conversations, they just do need to happen. So I'm thinking of like the you know, Voice Collective has a code of conduct that um, different institutions and organizations have signed on to about just kind of forefronting like the, the bandstand is a working place, like it is a place of business and we need to operate with sort of clear rules of conduct, um, or the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Um, so there are these places where um, forefronting women in jazz and then sort of gender more broadly as we start to expand that spectrum um, are, is a, a more transparent conversation going forward. And I think there is some hope about normalizing the, the 
conversation around women and jazz. Um, so with that, I want to really thank each of you for sharing your experiences, for sharing your wisdom and your knowledge. Um, I really just enjoy I've been taking the notes and um, really just enjoyed this conversation and I'm really looking forward to your gigs this weekend. Um, so I want to thank our guests and thank you for also being in attendance. community leaders and what have you. But, I, but I'll take up on the, on the last point you guys were talking about. Uh, my son's a jazz bassist, and he has talked to me about this vibing thing, because uh, I didn't know a lot of women in that scene. Um, I, I just generally, um, do you think that women jazz musicians are less vibey than, than, than men's jazz musicians? You know, can you speak to that experience? Yeah. I, I mean, there, sure, there's some you know, someone out there who maybe are a little bit insecure and they're just like, you know, like all these are, but they vibe a bit. I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I feel virtually no vibe in the momentum. I don't feel any vibe in this band for sure. I, I just don't think it's as natural a part of our, you know, way we express ourselves. But what do you guys think? Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here to say that, that, you know, because jazz has been a patriarchy, that women are not exempt from some of the same ways of dealing with each other as uh, men meant to. We're not exempt. So there's, it, it happens, yeah, it happens, it happens sometimes. I mean, I think, I think we actually have to even, we, we, we even have to make sure that we spend some time thinking about, do we interact with other women? Do we hire other women? Are we thinking about who, you know, how we can elevate uh, another sister that way? So I think there's probably less. Um, I think that, but I, I'll just say for me, I just think that one of the things that one has to do as an adult is to develop a thick skin. And uh, what has worked for me was a certain degree of just being able to ignore a lot of that and doing what I do. And I just, I just, that's for me. Everyone's got their own way of dealing with it. But I can't change other people's ways of interacting with me, but I can change how I, how it affects me, and I can, just, I can decide that that if you, you know, that I'm getting ready to go down on this base and you're not getting in the way of that, right? You can't, you can't get in my sphere when it's time to do that, you know? Yeah, and I feel like to me, it's like, it's, it's always like a matter of sensitivity. Like, and I'm not saying that, you know, women are more sensitive, can be more sensitive than, than, than men, but it's just that, you know, maybe it's like, it's, it's easier um, to put us in a, in a position of being like vulnerable, you know, and just like talk about, you know, the issues like that you're experiencing and saying, okay, I don't feel comfortable with, like with, with this particular thing, so can you do something about it? And um, so it's it's really a matter of like communication, like to me. And sometimes like you know, it's not about just like putting like you know a mask on and just like you know um, pretend everything is okay, but really talking things through. And it's something that you know I've, I've been playing with the uh, you know mixed um, bands, but also with all, all female bands, and I feel that, like, you know, with the, with the all female bands I play with, it's, uh, like, communication just works better, better, yeah. Well, in the history of jazz, there's been a lot of uh, competition, you know, started with ragtime pianist competitions back in the 1920s, uh, 19-teens and 20s, um, and, and then, you know, since then, there's always been some kind of uh, competitive element in jazz, and I think that that's still kind of comes in play at jam sessions, especially. Um, and it doesn't help that, especially with women, there's usually, like I said, that one spot, that one person that really, you know, is, is recognized for something. And so with women, especially on the same instrument, I notice that there is sort of maybe a vibing, it's because we're competing for that one thing. And I want, I really would like that to end um, because we're all very special. You know, we all have something to contribute, something to say, and I think it's changing. 
but um, there's also a, a competitive element to the music, uh, which, which, on one hand, is not you know competitiveness is not always good, but on the other hand, it holds you to a certain <coughs> standard. And and I think when people are vibing, most of the time that might be where it's coming from. Um, and like Francesca said, sometimes it's just a conversation, pulling someone aside, saying, "Hey, I, I thought I noticed that maybe you didn't like what I did, or you didn't like that. So you know, what can I do differently?" But on the other hand, it's, it's also, in a way, like a sports team. If you miss the winning shot, you're probably going to get by. You know, so, um, you know, and I don't like to think of jazz as a, as a sport. But at the same time, um, on the bandstand, we are a team. And if you're sitting in with somebody, you're still a part of that team. Uh, so I think, yeah, a lot could happen with a conversation. But that's, that's embedded in the history of music as well. I just chime in and say there's, and, and there is something else that's really interesting about this. When you think about what the general values have, that there are have been in place for the music, and I know um, a lot of young women, I know kind of, not all of them, but, but some uh, rebelled against what we kind of call the higher, faster, louder, that so only certain types of musicianship are really valued in certain circumstances. I'm not saying across the board, but you know, you got to be able to play, and, and you need to be able to do everything. I mean, I'll just put that up there. You got to be able to play, um, you know, a tempo, you play beautiful ballads, be sensitive, be, you know, whatever it is, I mean, you need to be complete musicians. But I have certainly found that, especially maybe, I don't know, 50 years ago or so, maybe still somewhat today, that the values in general seem to be more, you know, you've got to be able to play great tempos, you play hard, you play aggressive, all these terms are associated with music that generally are seen to be a little bit more male-oriented, and if you are very sensitive, or you have a beautiful sound, or you, you know, play gorgeous ballads, it's not quite as, as important in some circles, and I, I do know some of my female students, you know, gravitate, you know, to be able to do that, and you know, to encourage you to be able, to, like I said, you got to be, be able to play in all kinds of different situations. But there's been a bit of bit of that. We were talking about this um, last night. You know, being told you don't sound enough like a male, or you know, you don't. You know, when I was in college, I was criticized for not sounding like you know, Chick or McCoy, uh, and for sounding too much like the Lemons. And my my thought was, well. Was anybody telling the Levins he sounded too much like the Levins? You know, I don't, I don't think so. So why was it bad that I sounded like the Levins? Thank you. Thank you. I just have a comment. My daughter's like, don't say anything. Put your hand back. <laughs> <laughs> she see she's moving on. <laughs> First of all, I'm so excited to be here. I was born and raised in Detroit. I'm a, little, a Michigan alumni, so <laughs> I'm a Wolverine. And um, one of the first concerts my dad took me to, he's a huge jazz enthusiast, he hung out at Baker's and everything, was straight ahead. So I was oh, honored to, <laughs> to meet him. <laughs> um, I have to take a picture for my dad. So <laughs> but um, I, I, I say other than that, I, my dad, I think one of the reasons why jazz was so important to my father, he really um, um, indoctrinated, you know, exposed me to so much in Detroit, and of course, because Detroit has so much to offer. Um, was that I played classical piano, and I think he told me later on that was his dream was for me to pursue it, um, which I didn't. But um, <laughs> um, I just, I, as I'm listening, I, I, I'm kind of like, oh man, had I had this kind of somebody who believed in me, who or who could push had pushed me, right? What if? But I'm sitting here also with my children, thinking how encouraging this is for them to be to hear the words of, okay, what do you do when? You are the eyeball. What do you do when um, you know you may be discouraged? So I want to thank you all for participating in it. It was so important. I'm so thrilled to be here. And I, I hate that I missed last night. I didn't know about it, but I heard that you guys have things going on this weekend. Yeah. Is there something? Will you be giving out information? Or okay, great. Yeah, absolutely. Because <laughs> I would love to tie. Yeah. And there are four shows. Two oh. shows tonight and two shows tomorrow here? night. Tickets are on sale at the Jazz Room. Information's at the table there and on our website. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Please come out. I will be here. Yeah, It's packed last night. What's it? Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Any other questions before we wrap up? Maybe one or two more from the audience? Comments? This is so awesome. Thanks for being here. So I imagine it makes you guys all travel, and, you know, it's just, it's great. Um, I, I'm not a musician, but I play softball. I played softball for 15 years, and it's interesting how some of the issues you have in, in the music world also are in sports, <laughs> because there isn't really a future, for instance, for girls except in sports. Like, there is no league. 
so it just reminds me about how important it is for us to as women like think about how we all need to have a future and everything that we're good at you know and it, it, these the wins need to like think how do we in thinking about how do we have mentorship programs for women in whatever you do what does that conversation look like how can we start where do we start does that start in a school does that start at home does it you know faith in your in your faith practice whatever that is i don't know but this has given me a lot to think about so thank you all thank you thank you okay um since this organization was put together 10 years ago, I had the uh, pleasure of working with young female drummers that came up. I never worked with female drummers before. I never talked before until we started this organization. One thing I found is that the girls were more focused, more determined, more tenacious compared to the boys. The boys are more relaxed and chill, like whatever. You know, but the girls, they seem to have a vibe to want to prove themselves and be successful. I just wanted to make that statement. That's for, as a drummer, as a drummer. And we have an amazing young bassist as well, who's also fierce, you know, and the ones that have come through our program and have gone on to, to learn, they just have this, I don't know, this type A personality. I don't know if that's developed, because, you know, for the reason that you guys express, they just seem to be a certain, I don't know, yeah, fierceness about it, which I admire. Um, the question I have for you guys is just as musicians, as jazz musicians, do you feel that swing is being slowly eliminated from the music consciously 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 or subconsciously and what about the history of the music do you think you think it's being disseminated evenly fairly clearly can you speak to that i'm um, gonna first i'm gonna talk i'm gonna talk about the name of my the next record i'm doing which is called forbidden swing so that's yes yeah, so that's your answer my answer is that i do feel that um, first of all, swing is hard. The hardest thing. Yes. It's hard. It does not. It does not transmit well in an academic setting. It requires one to do a lot of listening. And so I think that a lot of times people are not doing it because it's hard. And one has to really learn uh, when you finish getting your uh, jazz um, degree. You're you know getting a bachelor's, which I like to call your learner's permit. That, that's to me your learner's commitment to go out and actually learn what they put in the number of hours it takes to be able to internalize something that is as subtle as swing. So I do think that straight A's is a lot easier to transmit within an academic setting. And, and let me just say this, I say this as someone who I consider myself to be a modernist. I like all kinds of music. I'm from Detroit. I'm, I'm, we, 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 we're like ground zero for Contemporary gospel, funk, hip hop, you know, uh, R and B, blues, uh, all you know, all those forms. So I come as someone who loves all kinds of music, not as someone who says we're only going to do this. I'm just saying that that is being it's being obliterated because people don't want to take the time to do it, and it's not it's not teach well in an academic setting, which is where a lot of jazz is being taught now. So that that would be my first comment. I can't even remember what the rest of us because now you are now you got me on one of my real soapboxes. But I do think oh, in terms of the history, I think I think that the kind of things like that um, that um, that Ellen and Sherelle were talking about, we have to make those a part of our everyday conversations. So when we talk about music, when I used to talk about music and uh, with my mentors in our, our groups, they would say. They would say, oh, Count Bass used to play this all the time, right? They would give a firsthand recollection of how people, how people lived, how they, how they talked about the music, what, what music they played. Um, I, remember, I remember my mentor, Marcus Belgrave, was the one that told me that Clifford Brown used to write out his solos. And I give this information to my, to my students all the time. I said, listen, if you can't come off right off the top of your head on the solo, it's still yours if you write it out. If you create it, it's yours. It's your composition. To your solo, write a solo out. I said, you know, there's just so many ways that we just kind of have, we that that you know that that kind of information can kind of demystify the music and really get people to deal with it in a different kind of way. So I'm going to stop because I know there's other folks who are trying to forbid this way. Look for it after your next week. <laughs> uh, as always, I am in complete agreement with Marion, and I think uh, we could also, I'm not sure, we, you know, we should be talking about voice anyway. Um, talk about racism. I mean, black culture, this music is from black culture, 
And I am certainly not an authority on the subject. I don't pretend to be. I have a lot more to learn. Um, work in progress. Uh, but just as you know, a lot of black culture has been erased from history books, um, I think there's been a problem, and here again, jazz education is a double-edged sword. Um, how very learning music, but learning it in, in culture, from where it emanated, and it's the purest way I can think of to learn it. And we don't really have many, many young students coming up who don't have access to communities um, you know, where, where they can get learning music firsthand, or they don't aren't willing to take the time, like Marion said. I mean, I can't think of a number of classical musicians, pianists especially, who come to me in Michigan and say, uh, hey, yeah, I'd like to take a you know, half hour lesson a week for a semester so I can learn to play jazz. And <laughs> I've lost my, my I, I, I've stopped, you know, I'm kind of, you know, getting on with my career and I'm tired of, of being nice to them. <laughs> I, you know, just say, right, you know, frankly, I start to say, are you kidding? Do you know anything about this music? You think you can learn, you know, you're gonna learn to swing in a semester and you realize, I don't, I don't think so. Because I'm happy to help Lay some groundwork for you if you want, but it's it's I find it insulting. I find it a you know, and while, while I don't think they're being racist, I you know, but in my head that's what I'm thinking. In my heart, that's that's what I'm hearing. If you don't understand anything about this music, you don't understand where it came from and what the people who play it have have gone through in order to, to play it and express themselves in the way they do. And uh, I'm still you know learning a lot about the roots of the music. So I think there's uh, a lot going on here in that question, and uh, I. Love to swing. I wouldn't say that uh, I swing as hard as I would like yet because I did not grow up a, you know, there's no clap. Like I would say, there's no clapping on two and four in my congregational church. Um, and, and so I've been gradually, you know, immersing myself more. Uh, and I just, the more I immerse, the more I realize I have to learn. But that is a great question. And yes, I find my students, some are just immerse deeply and uh, listen to all the great artists and you know, students of both of all races and colors and genders are swinging their tails off. And there's a lot who are choosing to go, you know, more down the straight eighth path and you know, I want to honor that too. But at the end of the day our department is jazz and contemporary composition. So you know, I'll get on my whistle box and take Yeah, we'll yeah. get on with X. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so both both Mary and Ellen said um, I completely agree with and trying to find something to follow that is difficult but I do have one other point um, to add on to that is um, the relevance of swing we're a long way from when swing was popular um, and I love I love all types of music don't get me wrong on this but there's something special about swing and when swing happens and when it happens right that it, there's nothing else like it in the world um, and I have trouble reaching my students because they don't see the relevance and the why of why they should swing. Um, when, to me, it's completely relevant. If we look at everything we're going through as a society right now, swing was a protest music, especially bebop. Bebop was created as protest music, um, and it's extremely relevant. But when we hear it as wallpaper in Starbucks, or we see people re uh, relating to swing as jazz hands, um, it diminishes the value of what swing really is and the deep history of swing. Um, so for me, it's really a struggle to find, um, to teach my students the relevance of swing and how it can still be applicable today. Yeah, I mean, I feel like different musicians like resonate with different kinds of, you know, like genres, you know, and, um, yeah, I mean, swing has, has been like a super important part of my, uh, you know, of my uh, growth as a, as a musician. But I, I also feel that, you know, it really depends, like, you know, like what, what, what the, the cultural background you're, from, you're coming from is, you know, it's like, for example, in, in, in Europe, like, for, I feel like jazz is something totally different than here. And it got me, like, I had to come to the States to understand that it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's not, you know, like more or less important, you know, but it's just something different, you know, where, you know, like way more, you know, like probably way more rational, you know, than, than you know, than, you know, than what American jazz sounds like. And it's, uh, um, and, and you definitely need to, you know, like um, study the tradition more, uh, probably. But on the other side, it's also like the beauty of jazz, I think it's, uh, um, like nowadays, I feel like it's, uh, it's, it's a 
it's morphing so much, uh, and, and of course we don't have to, um, like, we don't we don't have to take for granted those roots, and we really have to like um, honor them. Um, but but it's beautiful to, to see how in different parts of the world, like that that thing has you know has changed and, and, and morphed and had, had like you know having been influenced from I don't know electronic music, Indian music, and and all that. So yeah. See what you started. <laughs> <laughs> like my man said, he's got a bunch of questions. As I do, but uh, yeah. But I, I, well, I just have to. I'm just gonna just one color on this. The jazz at its roots is black music, and there's just really no way to separate and tease this out. You cannot separate jazz from its its roots in Black America, which is inherently racist. And so this is. This is part of what, what we talk about. It's part of what the academy is not dealing with because the academy cannot deal with that. It's the, you, can't, you can't go to the, to the place that is the suppressor of things and say, <laughs> why, <laughs> say why, are you, why are you suppressing things? Because that's what the suppressor does. Yeah. Uh, and it does. It's, it's a, it, the, the idea of suppressing and erasing, erasing the, the critical history of, 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 of the jazz with its roots is uh, is what it's all about, and but we have to be warriors against that. I think anybody that plays this music has a responsibility to make sure that the history of this music is not erased. It's it's our responsibility to do this. We have to do this. I do it every time. And when I teach when I teach black when I teach about uh, jazz history, we start at slavery. We we start well. How did they get here? Right. So we got to answer the first question. It's like why are black folks here? So we got to have. You gotta have the first question. Answer the first question. Don't start. Don't start by. Don't start where we were. They were playing. No. Don't start there. Start well. Why did they get here? Why are we here? Let's get. Let's get that question going, and then we can. Then we can start unpacking all of the beautiful things, the good, bad, the ugly, the the, the, the tough things, the moments of beauty, of uh, of great place ways where humanity just stepped in, and we were, uh, you know, the beauty of humanity of jazz. But you can't do that until you. Answer the, the first question. The first question, which is, how do how do black folks get here? So, I would just say that it took us a ridiculously long time to get a jazz history class to camp in the musicology um, requirements at the U of M, and we're very thank God it was teaching that class right now. And even amongst some of our jazz colleagues, I had to keep reminding them that this had to be a requirement for jazz company, and that shocked. So, I mean, academia has all the It's such a paradox because um, that's the reality, but at the same time, like, as a jazz musician who's not black, I feel perpetually inept and inferior. And, like, there's a part of this that's my world and my soul that I don't own and can't claim, and uncomfortable. In that place, and so I, I don't, I don't know what to do about that. And it's very interesting to hear what you're saying that that is it's such a paradox that like we're fighting to even get the basics of the spirit of the music as a requirement in a college setting. And at the same time, I don't know how other women who are not of color who are jazz musicians feel about that role and how it's affected them. I'll just speak briefly, and then I work with like one of you. I'll, I'll just say that if you lead with your humanity, that that is the place at which you will under, that you, that you tell, that you'll be able to feel that here. You have to just lead, lead with your, lead with your humanity, try to let a lot of the other stuff go. But you have, if you lead with humanity, you will be able to find a place for that. Then maybe we'll feel okay. Why don't you do it, Jimmy? He would always say music is big enough for all of us. Um, and, and you get to it, it's an oral music. You know, and if you don't, if you're trying to read music and get to it, we're reading, but we, we're also doing arrangements this week. It's a different thing. But if you're learning to solo and to play, to speak through the music, you have to learn it through the tradition of learning it orally. Um, but, but like Marion said, if you um, approach, you know, people with love and compassion and finding humanity in the music, in yourself and in other people, uh, that's really what it's all about. I can jump in a little bit because this is something my students are constantly kind of jumping in on. 
and something that I, as a, as a jazz historian, a lot of white jazz historians who have done really bad things in jazz history throughout the history. Um, so um, I am kind of in a kind of constant conversation about how do I write sort of ethical jazz histories and inclusive jazz histories. Um, and something like from the academic perspective to jump on there, I was able to get a PhD in musicology with a jazz dissertation without taking a single course in jazz history. Because well, I'm not surprised. there yeah, were I'm none offered. Um, so all of that was on on me to do on my own and go into other departments to get sort of that information. It wasn't it wasn't a requirement at my institution. Um, you had to do the Western classical stuff. That's unsurprising, probably. But um, uh, but for my students, what I kind of tell them, and it, and it goes back to what you're saying, is that I think something that is really unique about jazz performers is that that connection to history is so there. Jazz performers often are some of the most knowledgeable about their history, and I think that that's sort of the key crucial element of sort of jazz performers, no matter what, where they are in jazz and what they're playing now, that there is a knowledge of the tradition and a recognition and a respect for that tradition um, and, and where it's coming from. And then I think that, that success as a jazz musician demands that, and that I think a lot of our audiences are hopefully demanding that too, that, that they can hear those, those legacies and they can hear that humanity first um, approach as well. Um, so I don't need to jump in on top of you, but I would like to hear those stories. I think this is a great way for us to end. I just want to say thank you to all of you uh, for being here and joining us for this amazing, amazing discussion. I have to thank this wonderful panel, you guys. <laughs> thank you so much. We got so many. <coughs> great bits of information, so many jewels, and just a lot of value that I think will continue to uh, to feed our audience, certainly fed me. I'll be chilling on this for a while. Thank you all. You guys are all masters in, in the music, and we appreciate you. And also special thanks to our uh, moderator, Dr. Kelly have your ticket to the jazz room um, please grab your ticket to the jazz room featuring um, the Ellen Rowe Quartet this evening or tomorrow night tickets are still available still on sale uh, at the Blumenthal box office so thank you guys again and uh, hopefully we'll see you later on this evening